Countryside is on display Pack up your caravans we'll Travel down a great highway Through our wide sun-blessed land The Leylands, Australia Great Aussie holidays Australia, let the Leylands Show you the way The Leylands Will show you Australia Let the Leylands Show you the way Australia is not only the driest continent on earth, it is also one of the least populated. And nowhere is this vast emptiness more apparent than when crossing the Great Australian Bight and the Nullarbor Plains. Our great caravanning odyssey around Australia started in Brisbane and has taken us through Queensland, the top end of the Northern Territory, Central Australia, the Kimberley of the North, the West Coast of Australia and the South West. On this leg of our journey, we will cross the Nullarbor to South Australia. Along the way, we'll see how creeping, wind-driven sands consume all in their path. Meet an ex-surfer turned slump glass artist. Go fishing for razorfish. Go swimming with sea lions. Visit weird Inselberg formations. Drive through the Gawler Ranges. And conclude with the desolate expanse of one of the largest salt lakes in the world, Lake Gairdner. The air highway, which stretches right across the Nullarbor, connecting the vast expanse of Western Australia with the eastern states, is unique in the world. Some sections of it are used as emergency airstrips by the Royal Flying Doctor Service, and have runway markings painted on them. It also contains the longest straight stretch of road in the country, 146 kilometres without a bend. Towns and roadhouses are a long way apart in this part of the world and it's not wise to drive at night, so when sunset approaches we stop for an overnight rest. Uh, not yet. Should move it a bit longer before we leave it. Dinner is quickly whipped up in the caravan while nature turns on a sensational sunset. What could be better than this? A second helping. Right, Robert. This is our second day on the air highway and uh, last night's storm, which looks so spectacular, has in fact turned to rain. The shoulder of the road looks firm, but looks can be deceptive in this traditionally dry part of the country after just a small amount of rain. A heavily laden road train bogged in the roadside goo and his two rescuers are a timely reminder to stick to the road. It seems a little weird with all this rain, but in the past several people have perished through lack of water. So frequent water tanks with oversized collection roofs have been constructed to gather what little rain does fall. The rain has prompted the hatching out of thousands of flying ants. These insects take to the wing to move on and start new colonies. The wet ground will make the ground softer and easier to dig. Perhaps they have encountered on such strong winds as they seem to be sheltering in the lee of the bushes. Mobile phones don't work along the air highway, but there are several emergency phones like this one situated at rest stops along the way. As we approach the South Australian border, we descend from the Nullarbor Plateau and arrive at the old abandoned telegraph station of Eucla. Almost buried now by encroaching wind-driven sand, these sturdy walls, which once echoed with the tapping morse keys, are now a silent link with the past. One day it will probably disappear beneath the sand and be forgotten. Will the messages it was instrumental in delivering, both of joy and sadness, be forgotten too? We hope not. These lonely telegraph stations were the only outposts of civilization when this land was still untamed. Returning to our caravans through the sand dunes, we find a visitor has slithered in from the windswept waste. Luckily the snake quickly returns to the safety of what little scrub survives here. It's probably a venomous brown snake, best left alone. 
A little further east we have easy access to the most remarkable cliffs in the world. Stretching for about 600 kilometres, the cliffs of the Great Australian Bight tower over the Southern Ocean. Today the ocean is boiling with a huge school of tuna. A truly awe-inspiring sight at the Nullarbor's lofty grandstand on nature. No trip across the Nullarbor is complete without spending some time on the precipitous edge of these cliffs. The limestone cliffs, up to 100 metres high, are under constant attack from the erosive forces of the ocean. These remarkable cliffs are part of a thick bed of limestone which was formed under an ocean 20 million years ago. It was pushed upward by later earth movements and today represents the largest expanse of flat bedrock in the world. I need to get binoculars back. I want the next. We spot a number of sea lions basking on the sun-drenched rocks at the base of the cliffs. At least they're guaranteed an undisturbed rest down there. These astounding cliffs of the Nullarbor were first explored by Edward John Eyre in 1841. After an unsuccessful attempt to discover new pasture lands to the north of Adelaide, he set off westward with his companion Baxter and three Aboriginal guides to reach Albany in Western Australia. The trek was foolhardy, but he was driven by the desire to explore. Eyre and his party suffered unimaginable hardship. Horses had to be eaten. Baxter was murdered by two of the young Aboriginal guides and in the end only luck saw them through. His amazing feat was recognised as one of endurance. Today the highway which spans this emptiness bears his name. Some of the early equipment used to construct and maintain the highway is on display beside the ribbon of bitumen. Eventually, after one of the longest drives in the country, we arrive at the small town of Penong. On the outskirts of town, we spot an old shearing shed which has been converted to a craft centre and museum. It's run by the artisans who display their work here. It's here that we come across the work of slump glass artist Cindy Dante. Cindy invites us to her modest home not far from town to see how she produces her glass craft. She came to Australia from her native California in America in search of our famous surfing beaches. She found the surf and stayed. Here she can practice the art she loves and still visit the surf, which is just minutes away. Although she admits to having very little time for the surfboard these days, she's not complaining. She uses a technique known as slumping. To create the mixture of colours and shapes, Cindy sprinkles each piece with fine coloured granules of glass. This is the tricky and time-consuming part. When the delicate works are ready, they're placed in a kiln at just the right temperature to cause the glass to slump, but not to melt. The colours fuse together in the most delightful way, provided of course Cindy has done everything correctly. Cindy says she draws the inspiration for her designs from the ocean which she loves so much and which is just around the corner. Most of her designs depict objects of the sea. Back on the highway we soon reach Sejuna and have now crossed the Nullarbor. Cool stuff, no worries. And you had a good trip? Yeah, not too bad. Something fall over, Carl. Well, she just dropped, just it. dropped it in the bucket. We must not take any fresh vegetables or fruit past this point to protect South Australia's fruit growing regions from pests. No worries at all, folks. Okay. Next stop, Streaky Bay. Show you the way. Streaky Bay on the western side of Eyre Peninsula is a picturesque little village which was established as a wool port in 1865. The bay was seen and named by the English explorer Matthew Flinders in 1802. He witnessed streaky effects in the water and thought it was caused by a large freshwater outlet mixing with the salt water, but this was most likely the effects of oil given off by seaweed. The town was first proclaimed as Flinders in 1865, but was renamed Streaky Bay in 1940. 
Although it serves the pastoral needs of the region, it is fishing for which it is best known, both professional and amateur. In recent times, Streaky Bay has become a popular caravanner's destination, with an excellent park right on the waterfront. We're about to go fishing, but for this kind of fishing we don't need any bait, we don't need any fishing lines, and we don't need any fishing nets. In fact, all we need is something to protect our feet, in this case some boots, and something to protect our hands, some leather gloves, and of course something to bring home the catch. We're going out there on these mud flats to get what's known as razor fish. They're a kind of shellfish which live out there in the mud flats. Little potholes everywhere, you've got to watch where you're walking. See what I mean? To reach the razor fish beds, we must set off right on low tide when they're exposed above water. Carmen and I have borrowed some long handled pliers made especially for this purpose. They can also be hired in town. One down, 49 to go. <laughs> Pulling them by hand does work, but the pliers are much easier. The exposed part is razor sharp, hence the need for all the protective gear. It's 13 there. I'm about to say, is anyone counting? Yeah, I just can't. Oh, Robert's out there, he says they're pretty big out there as well. <laughs> The locals tell me that when they were children growing up in this area, they used to come out here and get these strictly for bait. They regarded them as only any good for bait. Hey, go on, girls. All right. According to fellow travellers we met in the caravan park, they're supposed to be good to eat. I sure hope so. So you got any bit recipe ideas for these? Oh, I've got a couple I've heard. I haven't tried any of this before, but um, I'll experiment a bit and see how I go. We take our catch back to the van park to strip the fleshy bit out of the middle. We're allowed 50 eats per day, which seems a lot. The edible bit is only quite small. Now this is how this is the technique I've got, right? You stick it in the hole, you just cut the and you just snap it off. And then with the one swift action of the knife, you slip it in there. I've got to go around like that. No, you're wasting your time. And then you go around like that. You're wasting your time. I open the knife. Hey, Presta. <laughs> You're wasting your time. Well, yeah. what's your idea? Yeah, if you're cutting them all in half doing that, you're yeah. supposed to have them in one piece. Yeah, but they're all like little siblings. Oh, you're making hors d'oeuvres out of yours. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were just doing them whole. Yeah, but I don't want them. They look mangled when they just rip when you do it your way. You leave half of them off the shelf. If you're following my technique. You can't go wrong doing that. <laughs> well, I did. Looks like Mangled. a scrambled egg. <laughs> oh gee, I'll never eat scrambled egg again. Looks like the sort of thing that somebody might have after had a bad chest cold on me. Oh. The three of them have been at this for about an hour now. And look how many they've still got to go through. So why aren't you doing anything? Oh, well, I don't have a knife. <laughs> The next step is to wash off all those gritty bits of shell and sort out Robber's mutilated ones from the others. I've separated the razor fish into three different bowls. The first bowl, all the little bits, are going to be marinated in lemon juice. The other two bowls, the meat is going to be tenderised and then cooked in either a batter or breadcrumbs. I hope this is all worth it. I don't know what they taste like and no one can tell us but they cook up well and sure look the part. We decide to serve them with a simple salad by the foreshore of the bay. Want some mayonnaise? I'm all right. Chili and mango. Is this special mayonnaise? Chili and mango. Oh, okay. No point in those seagulls hanging about. There's going to be none left over. Razor fish, it seems, are a success. This is the crumb one, but I prefer the battered one. How are you, Carmen? Which one do you like? I agree with Mum. I like the battered one better. It's not too fishy a taste, is it? No, it's quite nice. It's beautiful here. With a beautiful sunset over the nearby outcrops known as the Dreadnoughts, a perfect end to a perfect day on the road.
Next morning we pay a visit to local identity, Mike Hunt. It's a specialist knife maker. Any idea how many knives you've actually made? No, I did number them up to 500 and I'll give it away after that. Because <laughs> you got that coming to a fine point. <laughs> oh yeah. What makes Mike's individually handcrafted knife so special is that he makes them from broken saw blades. He uses band saws, circular saws and even old chainsaw bars. Most are supplied by sawmills. Mike manufactures knives according to a number of standard designs which he has developed. He is always willing to listen to any new ideas and is happy to experiment to produce exactly what his client orders. And you found saw blades are the best things all around? Well, you get them for nothing. <laughs> yeah. Or somebody will give you a big saw blade and they say, oh, can you do us a knife out of it and put it in return? Yeah, yeah, no hassles. Every step in the process is carried out by hand, right down to carving the hand grips and making leather sheaths for each knife. Mike likes to keep some information to himself. It's taken years to perfect the process which alters the temper of the steel. When it's just right, the knife should last a lifetime. Mike has been making knives for eight years now and loves his work. He must do, with so much labour involved in each one, he would never really make much of a profit. Next, we come face to face with some sea lions. While we're stopped in Streaky Bay, Carmen and Robert receive news that their new truck is ready to pick up in Adelaide. So Lorraine and I stay while they make the 700 kilometre trip to drop off the Explorer and return with the new second-hand F250 four-wheel drive. Robert is naturally keen to set it up just right for the future and makes an immediate start. These water jerry cans have been ideal for camping. But with our new truck, we've decided to build a water tank into the back made of 150mm PVC piping. The pipe is easily cut to length and by using a variety of elbows and T-pieces as joiners, it is simple to assemble without the need for special tools. The glue sets quickly so I must work fast. With pipe this size, there's no margin for error when lining up the components. The finished design looks a bit odd, but this lightweight tank will hold 70 litres of water and should, if I've measured it properly, fit neatly across the cargo tray of the truck. A hose draining from the bottom leads to the back tailgate where it is fitted with a tap. Installation is now finished and I have fitted a breather running up the top here to allow for thermal expansion when the temperature increases and decreases. After several flushes, the tank is ready to fill for camping. I must now set up the caravan for towing. The first step is to level the van and measure the heights both front and rear. I've also measured the truck. After lowering the fully laden caravan onto the tow ball of the fully laden truck, I must check to see how much the truck has gone down in the rear. Using two powerful spring-loaded stabiliser bars on the towing hitch, I can adjust the tension with chain links to bring both vehicles back to level. With the job completed, we are all set to resume our journey. Only now we have plenty more room and a huge 7.3 litre V8 diesel motor to do the job. Soon after leaving Streaky Bay, we paused to examine a roadside waterhole which was used by Edward John Eyre when he explored this part of the country. Eyre's waterhole is one of only a handful which tap into an underground water supply in this otherwise very dry country. It may look insignificant to modern travellers, but in the age of the horse it was vital. Fifty-five kilometres south of Streaky Bay is the only known breeding colony of Australian sea lions to be found on the mainland. 
At Point Labat, the wooden viewing platform high above the crumbling limestone cliffs is as close as people are allowed to go to these amazing animals, which are some of our country's most endangered marine mammals. The name lion has been applied to these animals because of the roaring sound they make when calling their pups. They were once killed to be boiled down for oil, and today only number about 12,000. Compared to the millions of individuals for other species of seal, this is not a lot of animals. To see the sea lions up close, we travel a little further to Baird Bay, where we can join an eco-tour that takes groups to an isolated part of the bay where they're usually found. The operator can't guarantee a close-up encounter, but Mal gears up just in case. You can see that I'm used to getting in these things. I think a straight jacket would be more comfortable. <laughs> Even if the seals don't turn up, we've already had our entertainment for the day. The water temperature is quite low and the sea lions are found sunbaking. Upon spotting us, however, they come frolicking into the water. We're told to be patient and let the sea lions come in closer. We must move slowly through the shallow water and with luck the curious animals will come and join us for a swim. It's extraordinary to think that these are wild animals. The sea lions have come to know the diving groups and just love the chance to meet us as much as we want to meet them. The experience is unique. Many people find it so moving they come back time and time again. too soon, it's time to move on. Next we see some haystacks made of stone. Let the lands show you the way. Back when the early settlers came this way, this road we're travelling on was used by horse-drawn vehicles. One time a coach was coming along here with a passenger from Ireland. This Irishman looked up on the hill and could see these haystacks. He said, oh, I know the man that built those haystacks knows a thing or two. And he, in fact, was an expert in agriculture. Well, those haystacks are still there today. Just up the road, in fact. From a distance, they do indeed look like haystacks. But up close, we soon realise that they are, in fact, weird, eroded outcrops of granite. The rocks are on a property which was once owned by Mr Murphy. And after the Irish agricultural expert's classic error, they've been known around here as Murphy's Haystacks. These geological oddities are known as Inselbergs, and they've been eroded this way by the action of droplets of water freezing around the base. Whether the story of the Irishman is true or not, we don't know, but it certainly makes for a colourful story. A little further along the Eyre Peninsula coastline, we drop into a spot signposted as Talia Caves. The road winds through windswept sand hills to a part of the coast very popular with fishermen. This is Anxious Bay. Beach fishing and surfing are the main activities around here, even for the gulls. The Talia Caves are not actually the conventional labyrinth of limestone caves you might imagine. They've been created by the action of the ocean. The coarse sandstone underneath has been eroded away, and in this particular case here, the roof has collapsed making this big opening. They call this one the tub. Mm -hmm. 
Access to the tub is only recommended on days when the sea is not too rough. It has a direct opening to the sea, which in rough weather churns in and out of the tub like an oversized washing machine. Another of the Talia caves is reached more easily. It too has been carved by the action of the sea. It's called the Woolshed around here, but seems to deserve a more romantic name, more fitting its likeness to some pirate's hideout in a child's adventure book. Back on the track, and suddenly we're confronted with a tragedy. A kangaroo burst from the roadside and collided with our caravan. The doe is dead, but the joey survived unharmed. It's completely demolished the drain system. There's nothing Mal can do but drag the dead animal from the road and take the young survivor to a wildlife carer. In our case, it's the local ranger. Just in here, the little lady. This is a western grey kangaroo, by the way. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. Western grey. Yeah, we went a little sure. <laughs> With proper care, she has an excellent chance of surviving. We head north away from the coast towards the Gawler Ranges. Along the way, we stop to see another of nature's rocky wonders. The Northern Territory has Ayers Rock. Western Australia has Wave Rock. And here in South Australia, we have Pildapper Rock. Now, Pildapper Rock is a bit like Ayers Rock, only a lot smaller. It also has a man-made gutter around the edge, and that's to collect the rainwater, because not much of it falls in this part of South Australia. The rock has many intriguing waves and shapes around its base. It's an easy climb to the top. From here, we can see the next few days travel into the Gawler Ranges. Pildapper Rock covers over eight acres of land, so it represents a sizeable catchment area for water. It also has excellent picnic and barbecue facilities which we're happy to use for a hearty breakfast. The real significance of such a barren expanse of rock is only truly appreciated when we hear how it was used by local farmers, like John Katursky. Pulled up a rock has been in our family since the early 1930s. If the country was being developed, then there had to be water, so they constructed uh, walls right around the base of the rock, and this was then conveyed to an underground tank of some 350,000 gallons by uh, means of uh, two drains, and, and whenever it rained, of course, we were dispatched to the rock with uh, whatever we could find, a shovel or a rake or a fork, to make sure that the drains were clean and the water actually came into the tank and got into the tank. When uh, you don't get enough rain, well then the tank emptied and it uh, was then a case of having to cart water. Uh, we were a little bit more fortunate, you might say. Our farm being on the lower side of the tank, once the water had stopped running and air had got into the pipe itself, it would not gravitate anymore. So father came up with the idea that if he soldered two honey tins together and uh, put that on the inside pipe, that uh, six inch pipe, he put a five pound jammed in and then a bit of uh, car tube, wrapped that around and then he had one of his sons sit in there all day and bucket the water into this uh, contraption and uh, that at least kept the, the uh, pipe full and we had, we were fortunate enough then to have water for our our uh, stock. We'd, we'd be in there all day uh, from uh, probably eight o'clock in the morning till uh, this time at night till almost sunset, just sitting in there, uh, yeah, bucketing water. Luckily times have changed, but the country ahead is just as dry as ever. Next, we reach the Gawler Rainbow. From Pildapa Rock, we head north to the Gawler Ranges and on to Mount Ives Station. Looks like some shearing going on just on the right up here, Robert. Might be worth stopping and having a look. <laughs> yeah, okay. Shearing time is a busy time and unexpected visitors are not necessarily welcome. But after a quick word with the owner, we're invited to watch proceedings as long as we keep out of the way. 
For Carmen and me, this is a great chance to see firsthand an age-old ritual which we have only read about. This is a very small shed, but the pace is just as hectic as the big ones. The sheep are pushed through quite quickly, and the fleece, once removed, is strained onto a table. Here the poor quality edges are discarded and the fleece is grated. Squashing the wool into a bale is a tough job. The finished bales must be evenly compressed and fall within a specified weight range. Too heavy and it will need to be repacked at the farmer's expense. The bales of compacted wool are sealed, labelled and ready for transport. Guess he wants to be a sheepdog when he grows up. Suddenly our journey toward the Gawler Rangers comes to a halt when a centre bolt snaps in the rear spring of our caravan. She's a goodie. Mel, you know how to do your tyres. Unfortunately, the mishap has destroyed a perfectly good tyre, but we have a spare for that, naturally. Luckily, we also carry a spare centre bolt. When travelling on corrugated roads in remote regions of the outback, motorists should always be prepared with a few basic spare parts. What could have been a major roadside weight is little more than a minor inconvenience as we replace the bolt and reassemble the spring. With the spring refitted, we're on the road again with the van as good as new. To arrive at Mount Ives Station, none the worse for our delay. Here Joan and Merv Andrews welcome visitors to their sheep station. For a modest fee, travellers who choose to stay receive a mud map, highlighting the main attractions of the nearby Gawler Ranges and a key to provide access through the locked gate. The station provides camping facilities as well as basic accommodation in the old buildings. A wander around the old vehicle graveyard can provide hours of interest to those so inclined. Just before sunset we head out from the homestead to a region of the property which supports a large colony of hairy-nosed wombats. Although it takes a lot of luck to spot these rare creatures, the region of gypsum where they have excavated their extensive burrows is amazing. The entire outcrop is undermined with hundreds of tunnels. Some of the excavations are very deep. Tunnels, often over 20 metres in length, crisscross and interconnect with sleeping and breeding chambers. Fresh droppings here. Mm. I don't think we're going to see any. No, a bit too windy. Next morning, not too surprised but little disappointed at not having seen a wombat, we set off on an expedition through the Gawler Ranges. We're all loaded up with our camping gear for the days ahead. Some stone ruins of an 1880s attempt to settle in this remote region stand on the side of the road as forlorn reminders of the pioneering past. These are the ruins of Pondana Homestead, cookhouse, sleeping quarters and shearing shed. The ruins of Pondana Homestead are crumbling now with the passing of time, but at the time they came here and constructed these walls using local stone, they probably thought that they were going to last forever. Like their hopes and dreams, they crumbled as time went by. The view, however, out the window here is just as good as ever. Show you the way. Much of the Gawler Ranges is on private stations and public access has been restricted a lot in the past. This is now changing with Mount Ives Station leading the way for motorists to reach some of the truly magnificent landscapes. Formed around 1,500 million years ago during a series of powerful volcanic eruptions, the ranges are mere remnants of their former selves. Exposed columns of rhyolite formed during rapid cooling of the rock 
represent one of the world's largest exposures of these fine-grained pillars of stone. The Gawler Ranges were discovered and first explored in 1839 by Edward John Eyre, who named them in honour of the Governor of South Australia. It's a dry region with a number of challenging tracks. In most cases, the tracks are used for property management and permission to use them must be obtained from the owners. Another striking example of rhyolite columns can only be reached by walking about one and a half kilometres along a rugged rock valley. These castle-like crags are best viewed in the afternoon light, when it's easy to picture the Gawlers as a lost primeval world. When Edward John Eyre, the explorer, came this way, he was looking for pasture land, but much of what he saw depressed him. The lush valleys he so longed to see were never there. He did, however, come across one of the desert's most stunning flowers, Sturt's Desert Pea. Eyre was the first to record this colourful plant, and he saw it quite near the site of Mount Ive Station. Today, it is South Australia's floral emblem. A plant he would most certainly have welcomed, if only he knew what it was, is the quondon tree. The fruit, although only providing a thin coating of flesh over a large seed, is quite edible, even if it's an acquired taste. What do you eat? Which part? Freshly bit on the outside. Bill, bill. Not your thing? No. They all dirty? Yes. Camping out in the bush is a team thing. Even though Lorraine is a cook, I still get to prepare the fire. Cooking on an open fire can be as simple as lighting a fire and cooking on it. What we prefer to do though, is make a special fire for cooking. Our fire is going to be a trench. I'm going to start down this end and dig our trench in the, works best in sandy country by the way, for about two metres. This way, when we're finished, digging our trench, we're going to light a fire the full length of that trench. Now on this end, we're going to keep the fire burning with plenty of flame and over that fire we'll be able to place a tripod like this and put the billy on it. The rest of the fire will be kept as a bed of coals. We can do all sorts of things, we could use a tripod like that, lay it over the coals this way you can put a saucepan or something like that close to the heat. If you want it a little bit further away, one of these gadgets is also handy. Just place it across the top of the coals and this way it's further away from the heat and you can use that for just simmering things. Also, because the fire is a trench of coals, the most important tool you use for controlling that heat is the shovel. In no time, a perfect cooking fire, but I'll leave the meals to the girls. Today I'm cooking braised steak and vegetables. First of all, I'm adding olive oil to the camp oven. When the oil is hot, add 750 grams of lean beef chunks. I need more fire under here now. A bit more heat? Yeah, a bit more heat. I want it to brown, not stew. Okay. Move some of this stuff up. Thank you. That's fine. Turned it up two notches. <laughs> Want a billy can on? Yes, please. Oh, fine. How's that going? You want a bit better? Yeah, it's a lot better now. That'll boil in five minutes. Now that the meat has brown, I'm adding water to cover it and then putting lid on it. Leave it to simmer for an hour. Okay, that's all right. Thank you. Oh, looks perfect. I've added an onion that's been chopped and a carrot also chopped and a tin of potatoes which I've cut in half. What I'm doing now is adding a bit of flour and water to thicken it. I have to cook that for about a minute. 
while it's thickening, put some seasoning, salt and pepper. Yeah. I'm adding Parisian essence for colour and flavour. Let's check these Johnny cakes, which is basically little dampers. It's just flour and water, and we've uh, thrown in some mixed herbs. You only need to cook that for another five minutes just to make sure the stew has thickened. Serve it on its own, or if your gang is really hungry, add a bed of boiled rice. It's great around the winter campfire. In the morning, with our appetite satisfied, we resume our journey north to reach Lake Gairdner. The lake is a designated national park, but to gain access to it, we must pass through the northern section of Mount Ive Station, and this is where the key is needed. Just off the track, we take a short diversion to visit a remarkable example of bush ingenuity. A dam constructed entirely from local stone has been sited in a hard rock gully by early settlers for stock water. There's a fair bit of water in there. Yeah, surprised. Recent storms demonstrate just how effective it can be. It's amazing how much work the original pioneers had to go to in this area to collect water. The average rainfall is just nine inches a year, which classifies this region as a desert. And the workmanship that went into this wall is so good that after several generations, it's still in good working order. The last leg of our journey north brings us to the remarkable expanse of Australia's fourth largest salt lake, Lake Gairdner. Amazingly, the almost pure crystals of salt are up to a metre thick in the middle of the lake. It's wet. When you pick it up, it's all good. Don't dry it out. The surface, dazzling white, crunching beneath our feet, and with the appearance of ice, is akin to an alien landscape. The crystals are so moist that pools of brine form in our footsteps. Insects which wander onto the hot expanse frequently don't make it back and become entombed in salty death traps. Lake Gairdner at sunset, another of Australia's great natural wonders. A remarkable place to pause a while before returning to our caravans to continue our journey of a lifetime, our odyssey down under. Next on Leylands Australia, we'll examine the Flinders Ranges. We take a ride on a real steam train. Go bushwalking in the hills. Fly over the most ancient landform in the world. See the world's oldest fossils. Take on some genuine four-wheel driving. Explore the ruins of glories long lost. And try some genuine Aboriginal tucker. Next on Leylands Australia. Our countryside is on display. Pack up your cab. For great travel information, why not collect Leylands Australia, the magazine? A new one will be in your news agents every three months. If you like our TV shows, you'll love the magazine. Islands, Australia, great Aussie holidays. Australia, let the Leylands show you the way. The Leylands will show you Australia. Let the Leylands show you the way.